In this and the following lesson, we'll take a look at the biology of good study strategies. We'll try to merge what we know about how the brain learns and remembers with typical approaches to studying and some mistakes that we often make when studying. Uh, topics covered in previous lessons will be brought up in this lesson, so if you're unfamiliar with any of the following concepts, you might want to watch lessons on, on those. Part 1, we'll just do a quick recap of the biology of learning and memory, utilizing these concepts. And then in Part 2, we'll examine some study illusions and misconceptions, and then remedies so that we can uh, use best practices to learn the most efficiently and effectively as possible. Now, in previous lessons, we've made a comparison between brains and the computer systems. Uh, brains and computers have a fast, limited capacity memory system. It's the RAM in the computer. And brains, as well as computers, have a slower, larger capacity memory system. And that's the hard drive here. So the goal of an education, then, you might think of it this way, is to strongly store information into long-term memory so that it is retrievable when needed. Now, the idea of strongly storing memories doesn't really apply to the computer system. So in other words, if, when memory gets written to the hard drive, uh, the strength of that memory is no different than the strength of any other memory on the hard drive, but brains work differently. We can have some memories that are weakly stored and others that are strongly stored. So the goal of an education is to strongly store information in our long-term memory system. In previous lessons, we learned about the working memory system, our short-term limited capacity system. And we said that uh, this system allows the brain to manipulate information and share information to other brain regions. It also has access to the long-term memory system so that it can search for related and rel relevant information uh, so that we can adaptively uh, guide our behavior. We also learned in the past about the semantic memory system and getting an education was integrating new concepts into this web of knowledge that we call semantic memory. The well-educated person has strong links between items in the semantic memory and that leads to faster access of the information and slower rates of forgetting. So down here we compared brains. This person doesn't know much about photosynthesis. It's not strongly integrated with other concepts. This person does have strong links to the relevant concepts and so this person would be able to tell us about photosynthesis. Education. We want the educational process to lead to this type of semantic memory network. The items are strongly uh, stored and they're linked uh, effectively to other related concepts. So, of course, the question is how do you go from the less e educated brain to the more educated brain? How do we make those strong links in the semantic memory system? Well, the beginning of the process is going to a uh, hinge on what it is in our working memory. So a long-term memory begins in working memory. And we'll see that the contents of working memory then have the potential to be stored in the long-term memory system. And a critical component of that process is the hippocampus. We can think of this as the gateway to the long-term memory system. So the contents of working memory will be processed by the hippocampus. And if conditions are right, whatever it is we were thinking about or experiencing can become a long-term memory. The concept that we used to describe that process was system consolidation, and that was the post-encoding reorganization of long-term memory over distributed brain circuits. So initially, the hippocampus is a critical structure for retrieving recently learned information, but over time, this consolidation process transforms the memory into a memory that's more dependent upon the cortex for retrieval. So the hippocampus makes memory traces of events in our lives and then over time helps to transition the memory to a larger and more long-lasting memory network in the cortex and we're going to call that consolidation. And in previous lessons we we also learned about why the brain goes through this consolidation process. But for now we'll just say the, the cortex is a larger memory store. It's going to be the hard drive. We can store lots of information here and consolidation is this process of making a, a hippocampal dependent memory into a hippocampal independent memory, one where the cortex it takes a, a, a more prominent role in retrieving the information. 
Now we know the hippocampus is important in this memory processing because of neurological patients like HM who had surgery, uh, doctors removed uh, this area of the brain, and he had a profound memory deficit. He could not make new memories. The hippocampus lies underneath the temporal cortex on both sides. Here we see a cross section. Here's the hippocampus here, and here the uh, cells have been stained. Here's a closer up look at the structure of the hippocampus. It does have Im an important organization, and that organization is thought to be relevant to how the hippocampus is processing information. So here's the basic idea. If we think about just a study session, well, we might be reading a text, for example. So the text will be in our working memory. In previous lessons, we learned that this will involve loops of neural activity with the relevant perceptual regions of the brain that are processing the text. Um, but the contents of working memory will also make changes in the hippocampus. So both the cortex and the hippocampus process the learning episode, which is the reading of the text. The hippocampus makes a fast memory of the text information and is needed to recall the text information for a while. So the idea is, is that while the cortex is processing the text, uh, the synaptic plasticity that's happening here is not sufficient to establish a strong long-term memory with just one uh, episode here. The hippocampus is making uh, synaptic changes here, strengthening certain synapses, and that's going to be an important uh, component of, of early learning. So within the hippocampus, stronger synapses between a specific population of neurons represents the learned information. These synaptic changes are the memory for the event. The changes are specific to the information learned. So here the idea is, is that prior to reading the text, the strength of the synapse was at some baseline level. And because we're learning now, this is a learning episode, the effect uh, in certain hippocampal synapses is to strengthen certain synapses and that is the biological basis of the learning event when we're reading our text. Now this isn't the uh, the extent of the memory. Remember the cortex is also processing and changing to some extent as a result of this learning episode but these hippocampal changes are very important uh, for the initial learning phase. The cortical memory trace is initially weak unable to be reactivated with typical cues without the hippocampus. The stronger hippocampal memory is used as an index or pointer to reinstate the memory in the cortical areas. Thus, recently learned information is dependent upon the hippocampus for retrieval. So while the cortex perhaps made some uh, slight uh, uh, modifications, synaptic plasticity um, had occurred in the cortex to some extent, the hippocampal plasticity event is the more significant one early on. Now, if we think of long-term memories, uh, our long-lasting synaptic changes between neurons in the cortex, the idea then is to strengthen the cortical memory trace. It was initially weak. We want to make that memory trace stronger. And this is the process of consolidation. So consolidation is the process whereby connections between the hippocampus and cortex allow the hippocampus to signal the cortex to strengthen the memory in the long-term memory system. Metaphorically, the hippocampus teaches the cortex to make hippocampal independent memories. Synaptic changes occur in those brain regions originally activated by the study session. However, cortical synapses require multiple reactivations to make changes that can last a lifetime. So this is the consolidation process. It's this reorganization of a memory over multiple brain regions. The hippocampus and the cortex will come to have different uh, uh, levels of involvement in a consolidated memory. Initially, the hippocampus is required for retrieval. After consolidation episodes, that would be no longer the case because we're, in a sense, strengthening the cortical representation of the memory. Now. Uh, strong memories then, when we uh, talked about making strong memories, require multiple consolidation events. So if we just study once, uh, we are not strengthening the memory uh, to its fullest, fullest extent. And this point about the brain regions that were originally activated by the study session, that's an interesting idea. We called that in previous lesson, lessons the reactivation hypothesis, that, that the brain regions that are involved in processing information also take part in storing long-term memories for that information. 
So consolidation has the effect of strengthening the cortical memory trace so that normal cues are sufficient to retrieve the memory. So what we're showing here then would be we're integrating new information into our semantic uh, memory system. Now scientists have discovered that sleep is very important in memory processing. Sleep does two important things. Sleep helps consolidate the cortical memory in the long-term memory system. During sleep, the hippocampus sends signals to the cortex in such a way that synapses involved with newly learned information are strengthened in the cortex. So it turns out that during sleep, this, this consolidation arrow here, some of this uh, processing is happening during sleep that the hippocampus is signaling the cortical memory trace to get stronger. So initially the uh, hippocampus showed synaptic plasticity increases in certain synapses and that was a memory trace in the hippocampus and then during sleep the hippocampus is going to help the cortex strengthen the cortical version of the memory. Another thing sleep does is sleep also resets the hippocampus in preparation for new learning. Synapses are weakened in the hippocampus so they can be strengthened again for new learning. The hippocampus, we can think of this as a sort of a fast-acting, limited capacity learning system. And, and one of the reasons for transforming a memory to become more cortically dependent is that the hippocampus needs to be reset for new learning. So here we have the arrow going the other way. That the, the learning that happened the, uh, on the day before or this day caused strengthening in certain, hip, uh, certain hippocampal synapses. And now they have to be weakened again during sleep so the hippocampus can be prepared for new learning. Well, good thing then that the uh, brain is undergoing this consolidation process to strengthen the cortical component of that memory. Now, why do this memory processing during sleep? Well, the cortical memories are stored in regions that were activated by the experience. So ongoing perceptual experiences would interfere with memory consolidation. So the idea is if we're going to store memories in the cortex, but the cortex is used also for perceiving stuff when we're awake, we don't want that interference. We don't want to be awake and per perceiving things if we're trying to store memories in some of those same brain systems. So when we go to sleep, we become unconscious. When we're unconscious, we don't have ongoing perceptual information or perceptual experiences that might interfere with this consolidation process.